Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning. Let's begin our service with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love and your care and that you have come to be with us. And Lord, ask that you would guide our thoughts this morning as we worship, that we could focus on you and lay, care, lay aside the cares of this life. Lord, ask that you would be with each one as part, give them the words to share. So pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We will have three songs, after which Mike will have devotions. Good morning, everyone. Take your hymns of the church, turn to number 50. Number 50. Number 217. If you're able, please stand. <clears throat> Number 217.
number 219. Two hundred nineteen. so morning. Greet you all in the precious name of Jesus, whose birth we are celebrating during this time. We think of Christmas as a joyous time, and it is, but it isn't always joyous for everyone, especially for people who are grieving the loss of loved ones for the first time. It's not necessarily a, a joyous time. Also, people who are burdened with, you name it. Sometimes the holiday seasons, Christmas season, has a way of adding to those burdens. And 
Last time I had devotions, I was speaking of trials and God's purpose in that. I felt I left a lot unsaid. I'm going to go back and pick up on some of that. I switched very abruptly from the way we feel in times of trial to God's purpose in trial. I want to take us back and focus on God's presence in trials. I read Job 23, verse 1 to 9. I'm going to go back and reread that and read one more verse. We, we know these things. I'm not going to say or bring out anything new. But sometimes we need to be reminded of the biblical truth. Especially in difficult times, we tend to forget. We tend to get so focused on the things that are hurting us that we forget the richness of God's promises. So I'm going to read Job 23, verse 1 to 10. Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Verse 3 of Job 23. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he will put his strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with me, so should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backwards, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, But I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him. That's where I stopped reading last time. And I said it was a very inopportune place to stop. And it is. Because verse 10 changes the whole picture. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. I chose that yellow glow stick on purpose. Because it shone a little like gold. And that's what happens when we allow God to have his work in trials. But the interesting thing about Job, the verse in chapters 1 and 2 of Job, we read the background story. Job didn't know that. And what follows is 35 chapters of man crying out, trying to find a reason for this. It makes no human sense at all. Why Job... As a perfect and upright man, why Job had to face this? It just, and there's, there's 35 chapters of men going back and forth. They're trying to figure this out. And it just, and then in verse 38, where, where was God in all this? It almost, Job obviously felt like God was far, far away. But that wasn't the truth of the matter, because in chapter 38 of Job, all of a sudden, God is there. Job 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkness counsel by words without knowledge? God was there all along. And we see that in many different Trials, again, I'm only going to scratch the surface of this, but there's many, there's many, many instances recorded in the Bible of this. In the time of trial, God is silent. And remember what I said at the beginning of the last the devotions last time. No one has more of the Father's attention than the one going through a trial. And that's a true statement. God doesn't seem to be there, but when God's purposes are through a trial is completed, he reveals himself again. Not that God isn't there. He is. But we hardly can see it at the time until we look back. But there's many instances of God not appearing to be there, but all of a sudden the picture change. It's like you zoom out and you see God was there all the time. Um, in the temptation of Jesus, which we re- find recorded in Matthew chapter 4, 
verse 11, after the temptation of Jesus by Satan himself, it almost seems like Jesus is alone, but he wasn't. But verse 11 of Matthew 4 says, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Jesus wasn't forsaken. He wasn't forsaken at all. Another, another example of this is Abraham, when he was called to offer Isaac. Do you think Abraham struggled with that? If he was human like you and I, I'm guessing he did. But Abraham was a man of faith. What's interesting to me, where was God in all of this? When Abraham took hold of the knife to slay his son, all of a sudden God speaks. He was there all the time. The um, shade... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they stood up to that king, and they, the king told them, either bow down or I'll throw you into the fiery furnace. They didn't bow down. Where was God? All of a sudden, when they were in that furnace, Jesus Christ himself showed up. There was, all of a sudden, there was four men in that furnace. And that's just, there's many of those instances. Stephen being stoned. In Acts chapter 7, all of a sudden, Stephen looked up and saw God. These these examples are given to us just to remind us, in a time of trial, God is there all the time. And there's many, many references that we can turn to that assure us of that. One is in Hebrews 13, verse 5 to 6. I'm just going to read that one. Another one is Isaiah 41.10, and there are numerous of these, but it just does us good to remind ourselves of these facts when we're in a difficult time that God is there. He will never leave us. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. That is a promise we can all cling to. Isaiah 41, verse 10, is a personal favorite of mine. Different verses speak differently to us at different times in our life. This one came very real to me. It is still very real to me. It's still probably my favorite verse in the Bible. Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, For I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. I'm going to stop with that. That's a promise we can all cling to. That is recorded in the Bible not only for Isaiah's sake, but for our sake as well. We can cling to that. Those are there for us. No matter what we're facing... Good times were bad. These really come into focus in a difficult time, but God is with us no matter what we face. With those words, let's kneel for a word of prayer for those of us who are able. Father, we have this before you once more. We want to thank you and praise you for your manifold, rich blessings to us. Lord, we thank you especially for your answered prayer and releasing your missionaries in Haiti. We see your great hand at work. Just pray that we can continue trusting in you no matter what we're in, that we can cling to your promises, the promise of your presence, the promise of your great riches, your grace. We thank you for that, Lord. We also continue to pray for the rest of the service, be with each of the Sunday school teachers now to take their part, give them pure thinking and ability to guide and teach as you had laid on their hearts. Pray also for Brother Maynard as he brings a message later. Bless him with prayer thinking, courage and wisdom to bring the message you have given to him. Lord, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for that, Michael. So oftentimes it's easy to forget that God's there and become discouraged. This time we'll dismiss for Sunday school. The Youth and Intermediate Committee was dismissed. <clears throat> Thank you.
the juniors. Primary. Preschool. And the adults can take their places. How many get tired of looking at the Christmas story? Be honest. Hope you're speaking the truth, because we're going to talk about this morning. The second verse that we, uh, I mean, the second song that we sang, the third verse towards the end, kind of caught my attention. Why Jesus came? He says, "Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth." All of you have experienced the first birth. God knows if you had the second birth transpire in your life. But unless that is taking place, you probably don't appreciate this season. And too often, too, people, people look at Christmas as a time of giving gifts, and it can be that. There's a lot more to Christmas than just giving gifts, a lot more. If it wouldn't been that Jesus came as a babe in a manger, you would not have Jesus' death, the resurrection, and now being the Father's right hand, interceding on your behalf, that you could experience like the songwriter wrote, have second birth. That's why Jesus came. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18 says, Come now, let us read together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as gold. Think about it. I understand talking about Christmas, but why did Jesus come? So that you could be redeemed and be one of God's chosen people this morning. When I started out with my lessons, like, what do you talk about? Well, matter real short time, I had 14 questions. Now, you know I like, I ask questions. But for some reason, it is one question after the other just came to my mind. And I'm not going to necessarily ask you to answer every one of them, but I'd like to go down through a number of them. But you look at this lesson that we have before us, a child of hope is born. I could ask what hope is in your mind this morning, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that opportunity, I guess, and give you the definition of, of hope. And I'll break it down, hopefully you can understand what hope actually is. Jesus is that hope, okay? It's hope, in, someone says hope is a person. We have hope within our lives, but Jesus actually brings that hope. But a child of hope is born. Hope is an optimistic state of mind that is based on expectation of a positive outcome with respect to events and circumstances. Now you understand it. I'll break it down a little bit more here. here. But it's the truth. Okay, continue on here. Circumstances in one life or the world at large. As a verb, its definitions include expect with confidence and to cherish as a desire with anticipation. I hope you can understand the last part of it. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. In order for you to receive hope this morning, I believe you need to have your eyes open. You need to focus towards God. Yes, there's times that it's not very pleasant in our lives. I'll admit that. Someone says, the very least you can do in your life is figure out what you hope for, and the most you can do is live inside that hope. 
and not admire it from a distance, but live right in it, under its roof. I'm going to read it again. The very least you can do in your life is figure out what you hope for, and the most you can do is live inside that hope, not admire it from a distance, but live right in it, under its roof. And that's given from Barbara, King Solomon. Isaiah says in verse, chapter 40, verse 31, says that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar in wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And I don't think that's the King James Version, but it brings out the thought of where you will get your strength and your power in your Christian walk of life. So looking at this thing of hope this morning, do you have, is it present within your lives? I would like somebody to define in your own mind a little later on and what is hope in your life. So I'm going to go down over a number of these questions here. I'm not going to read them all, but most of them. You think about some of these, you might think, oh, well, we shared a lot of questions. Maybe I do. But I think we need to have answers to the questions that we have so we can have that peace within our hearts. First one, what is hope? Who gives us hope? Does everyone have this hope? What must we do to receive this hope? What does hope do for them? Is hope a necessity in life? Can we share this hope with others? Why was this child born talking about Jesus? Among whom was this message first given? Our Sunday lessons, tend to go lessons dealing with this, but think about some of these questions now. Is there any significance with the fact that the birth of Savior was given to the oldest shepherds rather than some great individual? You know, somebody had a lot of wealth and fame and stature. Do you have the Prince of Peace controlling your life? If you don't, you don't have the hope. <coughs> Are you allowing him to give you peace and joy today? Do you believe that God loves you? And the last thing right there is, what are you doing to make others aware of the possibility of finding fulfillment and enrichment in their life? We only have 24 hours, uh, 24 hours a day. Are you using your time wisely this morning? As we look at the season that we're thinking about, living in, what are you doing with your life? Or are you some of those that are simply putting your head down and not, well, so what, it's just another Christmas season, people get gifts, people, some people seem to get along, other ones it causes turmoil in their life. I don't know how you have Christmas this morning. But somebody cared to share this morning is, what is hope in your life this morning? Make it personal. All of a sudden, it's still not my fault. So I normally don't wait for this time. I'm going to wait for somebody to respond. In my life, when I don't have hope, I don't have energy, I don't have motivation, I have no desire. Um, I reflect on a few times in my life when I was hoping to get out of this, and that keeps you going. Hope on God. Anticipating a better life. And how does that possible take place? Burke said, in case you didn't hear him, he's hoping or anticipating a better life. How does that take place in our lives? You know, sometimes <laughs> we might have anticipation or use the word hope or whatever for something better, but how does that take place in that, that application which he said? Can you just sit on the bench and go on the bench and do nothing? I believe you have to have faith in action. Faith in something better is in that and then act. Trust in himself. I believe that true too. Faith and trust has a lot to play uh, to do with as far as our hope. I don't think your hope is going to be established in your life unless you have faith and trust in God. 
I believe the children of Israel are going through a very dark time here when there is enemies coming in. And Ahaz, I don't know if you look in the background, but I did look into the background of Ahaz. And one of the questions I would have the fact of, was Ahab a good king or a bad king? Well, you don't refer to people as bad people, but was, in other words, was Ahab righteous or wicked? Anybody know? Prior to this, like, I, I don't remember necessarily reading about Ahaz. I probably did before, but who was it? Not Ahab, it's Ahaz. In fact, he was a lot younger. There might be somebody here that is this. He, he actually started reigning when he was 20 years old. How many of you feel capable you would be able to be in leadership, being a king this morning, being 30, 40, 50, 60 years old? Here you have a 20 year old individual. And he did not walk in the ways of his father, David, okay? Your father might have been a great individual, a great, you know, as far as somebody following the Lord. That does not make sure you are following the Lord this morning. It only takes one generation to make them depart from the Lord. Ahab was a very wicked king. And just, if you want to look at the back, background of this somewhat, look at 2 Kings, and then it also goes in 2 Chronicles, gives some more of, some more of Ahab acts that he did. But in our lesson this morning is, I don't know why Isaiah brought out what he did, but God speaks through Isaiah to, a, to Ahaz here, I believe. And Ahaz was supposed to make a request, but he refused it. How many of you, how many times do you and I know what God wants to do and we refuse to act upon that knowledge? But looking what Ahaz was doing, I said when he was 20 years old, he was put into leadership. He sought to find deliverance through the king of Assyria. Rather than going to the source of strength, the one that he should have went to, to, to God for deliverance, he sought to go to a heathen king to find deliverance there. He was also involved in burning incense. Which I don't think he should have been doing that number one, but he also offered his children. In other words, they were burnt by fire. Now in God's eyes, that's very wicked, okay? Yet even aside from Ahab being as wicked as he was, God desired that Ahaz would seek, seek a sign. In other words, he could be delivered. He refused it. Do you refuse for God to deliver you in your life? When the gospel message is given, have you refused to heed his message, or have you answered the call? The challenge is before you. It says in 2 Chronicles 28, 4, it says, He sacrificed also and burnt incense in the high place on the hills and under every green tree. And you say, what's, what's the problem with that? But it's, like I said, he was involved in offering his own children. How low can an individual get in their lives? When you do not put God first place in your lives, you are going to do things you otherwise would not do. So looking at this, our focus here this morning, to walk in the Prince of Peace into our lives as God with us. And we come to the first section, God is with us when the Son is given, and also, you know, as far as the second se section here, now, if you have thoughts on either one, that's fine. I'm not planning to read all the verses down through here. But looking at this lesson we have before us, how did Ahaz respond when the message was given to him he should ask a sign from God? And did he make a, rock, a proper choice? How did Ahaz respond? In your own words. You don't have to talk in Bible language necessarily, but in your own words, if that was... Related today, how would you say? He misused a prohibition God had given as an excuse for not obeying. Okay. Anybody else? It actually cost him his life. I believe, you might disagree, but I believe God once again open or give an opportunity for Ahaz to recognize God and his power 
Yeah, but he refused it. Too much about it. And he could have, you know, we could say, well, we shouldn't tempt the Lord, you know, or I don't know how you, what your thinking is about asking signs and all that. There are people in the Bible that ask a sign. You think of Gideon, you know, the fleece and the wool. You know, one was supposed to be wet, the other dry, and then he did it around the other way. I think of Zachariah, when he seemingly did not really <coughs> somewhat in doubt anyhow, and he was not able to speak for a span of time until the job was born. It was a sign given to him. There's different accounts. I think of Moses. When he was out there and the, the bush, I mean, there was a fire there and the bush was not consumed. There's certain, and you know, as far as God spoke through Moses, you know, as far as turning that rod into serpent and all that, and how God works in different ways. Should we ask signs today? Is it wrong? Is it right? Did you describe Ahaz as not following in the steps of David? So if he would have asked God for a sign, and the sign would have been plain as day. He would have been in a hard spot. He was anyhow. But, but, but think, right. think about, you said, should we ask for a sign today? The scripture has a lot of wisdom for us. And we're in a hard spot. I don't want to ask God because I don't know if I want the answer that he's going to give me. Isn't that where he has was? Okay. But you still did, I, I appreciate what you said, but you didn't say it was right or wrong yet. Is it right to ask for a sign or isn't it? Mm -hmm. You're right, I'm not doubting what you said. I, I, I don't care what the sign is. The sign can be in the scripture or the sign can be a brother in the church. Yeah, I think it's right to ask for a sign. Not in doubting, not in justifying ourselves, but in a clear direction. Okay. Do you all agree with your vision? <laughs> you walk by faith or you walk by sight? The question was, you walk by faith or walk by sight? We tend to want a sign when we are either struggling to believe what we should be believing, or when we'd rather not obey are trying to uh, either get out of it or to encourage ourselves somehow into obeying. It seems to be good in this case. Okay. My feeling is on that thing is depends why you're asking that sign. I can think of an instance, as I recall, a woman asked for a sign if she should wear the covering, and it was given to her. She should not. We need to be very careful. There are different spirits out there, okay? Does it come, does it correspond with what the Bible teaches? Or is it with what you want? I think of one of the kings, one of the Rehoboam, one Jeroboam, whatever, he tried to get advice from different people, you know, as far as what, how should, should he be as hard on the people as he was before, he went to the young men and the old men and all that. What did he choose? He chose what he wanted. He was the any father on life. So why you ask for that sign? Like Bert said, I think we can find those signs in the scripture. And I think it's wrong to ask for a sign when it's clearly stated in the Bible what you're supposed to do. Maybe I, Ahaz rightly did what he, as far as he said, should I tempt God? If he was so concerned about tempting God, why didn't he get his life in, in, in check with living for God? Offering his children up as sacrifice to the idols? Why is it so often people in life seems to be way up here in one area of life, but in some place else, they're way out of it. But they're not on fire for the Lord. I understand we will grow in our spiritual lives, but so often people that are not living for the Lord like they ought to seem to shine in one area, but in other areas they lack. Any other thoughts about this sign thing? I think it really does come down to the issue of what is your motivation for it. Um, Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, he writes, For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. So it really comes down to what is your motivation for asking for a sign. 
And that's what I, I would, I would uh, include the same thing. Why are you asking? Is because it's not clear in the scriptures. Is because you do not want to respond like you know God wants you to. You're trying to find a way out of this here. What's your purpose behind it? I don't think Ahab is really wanting to know the way of the Lord. But you know what? That didn't keep God from giving it. And we can be thankful to today that God did work out His plan, even revealing this at this point in time. I believe to a heathen king. God can work in heathen people, okay? But he can work much better, I believe, in people that are consecrated to him. Any other thoughts before we go deeper into the lesson here? To make this more personal, when God asks you to do something, how do you respond? And you're allowed to be honest this morning. When God asks you, asks something of you, how do you respond? <clears throat> Help me. Very good. Help me. How did Isaiah respond? He said, woe is me for I am undone. The closer he got to the Lord, the more he saw his undoneness. He just realized who he really was. But yet, even though he was merit or the vessel used by God, not that he was somebody great as himself, but with God, he was able to bear the good news. If it wouldn't been for Isaiah, who would have penned these words? Sure, God could have used somebody else. But God chose the prophet Isaiah to reveal his message, what was going to take place in his time. When the children of Israel were seeking deliverance, they were being oppressed, going through dark, dark times. And possibly this morning, you think you're going through dark times, and maybe you are. Maybe you're going through a tough time. You know, all of us have had bad days. If you haven't, let me know later. We've had bad weeks, months, even years. And it's so easy to feel discouraged in this life. Even if you have some blessings, you can count on. We just went through the season of Thanksgiving, and I hope you're still thankful this morning. But it seems like hopelessness and discouragement are so commonplace and pervasive in people's lives, and present everywhere, that we almost come something like commonplace to us. Like, we barely notice it. And yet, we clearly see the effects in each individual. When you are depressed, it's outward. I mean, it's chilled up on your face. Why should we be so uh, depressed? After all, hasn't Jesus taken place? Uh, is Jesus not living in your life? Doesn't he give you joy? That's why he came, to seek and save those that are lost. Like in Luke 19, 10, and give life to the full, John 10, 10. But if he's not doing that, I can understand why you are being depressed. It's not that we don't go through times of discouragement, but you dare seem to dwell there, okay? We need to get above that. And I understand <coughs> it's easier said than done. Jesus himself will provide a way to have hope and victory in the circumstance that you are encountering. You know, Jesus comes alongside of us himself walks with us. Let's not expect Jesus, you know, we're going down this road that we shouldn't be traveling on, Jesus to walk beside us. You know, let's get on the road that Jesus is traveling on and then into our life. You look at this miracle that God had given here, what's going to take place. Maybe you don't think a whole lot about it. But you think about this virgin birth. What does that, what does that matter? Okay. Trent Newt's water. I'm gonna pick on you. Is it important that Jesus was born from a virgin? Did it really matter? You can think about it a while. Okay. There should be some other questions. But when God spells something out in His Word, do you ever find any place in the Scripture that He did not fulfill? Anybody. God's made a promise. Have you ever found any place in the scripture that was not fulfilled? Other than the second coming of Christ. I'm, I'm not going back on that part, okay? But things, as far as other things like that. You ever find that God fell short in his promise? The Bible says God is not slack concerning his promise. There's souls today that are not saved. It's not that John 3.16 is not, not true, okay? But it's up to people's response, how you're going to respond to it. But there's also consequences. 
Now let's try to forget the question I asked him. We're going to ask him to respond. Was it important as a virgin birth? I think it was for Jesus to be the pure, pure virgin. Had it been otherwise, every one of us are sinners, okay? And con being conceived by the Holy Spirit, that sinful nature was not taken on. Jesus had to be that pure, innocent one to offer the sacrifice so that sin could be forgiven. Atonement once and for all, it definitely was. Jesus came from virgin. How is that possible? It's more than I can explain. Do you, you understand every part of the Bible? I hope you do by faith and trust in what God said, and you believe it with confidence. Or else you're going to have problems in your life. You know. A Christian life is a life of trust and faith in God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The Bible says that. You need to believe it. If you think that you can just simply understand everything, well, you must be a wise individual, so you're not really telling the truth. Be, be that honest. Now, not that you don't understand a lot of the scripture, but there are some things it's hard to understand, but God has given us enough to understand that we can walk in the ways of the Lord. On this virgin birth, anybody care to discuss more about this, the importance of it? What does it have to do with Jesus' birth or anything like that? I think of all the confusion and then or the, all the uh, maybe not confusion but the arguments that were about David being his father and you know, it just clarifies it that he is the son of God it solidifies it okay I think it was very very important you look in verse 14, it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. <coughs> what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. God with us. You know, you look at that time when the children of Israel, or the land of Judah, people of Judah, actually there was two, two uh, Israel and Judah at that point in time. In fact, part, Israel was one of the nations as far as coming, as far as taking care of Judah. If you look at in the, at the history of some of this here, there's two different nations. But if you look at a time when they were hurting, they were being suppressed by the people around them, and to have God with you, that should have been very, very dear to you. After all, these individuals, their ancestors, experienced the power of God, walking through the Red Sea and dry land, various different miracles God had performed. Now, if God is just with us, that ought to really help us. If they would have put their trust in God, then they could feel it. God with us. And that should be meaningful to us this morning. We don't have to wait for God to respond. God can be our presence here this morning. He can be within your heart. If Jesus is in control of your life. But the question is, is he? That makes all the difference. What are some of the other names you think of Isaiah that he brings out that Jesus is? What is Jesus to you this morning? I hope he's more than just a baby in a manger, okay? This Christmas story has a lot to do with that more than just simply Jesus in the name. Can you list the number of names that Jesus is? Now, I don't know if any of us have all those, that many different names. Now, I understand as we go through childhood, we get nicknames and all that down through. Not meaning that like Jesus had, you know, as far as different names that was given to Jesus because of who he was. Let's have at least eight or nine. We have a manual art. What else? Wonderful. Prince of Peace. Everlasting Father. Great Shepherd. Savior. Any other ones that come to your mind? Redeemer. If Jesus would not have bought you back, where would you be this morning? If Jesus would not have saved you from your sins, where would you be? 
if he would not be your counselor this morning, you can go to for guidance and direction of what you need. If Jesus would not be your shepherd this morning to guide you in the path that you should walk, let's think of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. A passage that many people in the past have used as far as on their cards, you know, as far as the funerals and that there. The Lord is my shepherd. You know what? If God is your shepherd in the casket, he would have been your shepherd before that. How many people have claimed Psalms 23 to be part of their life? Now, I understand other people put that in as far as a little card, whatever you want to call it. But, but if God is not your shepherd now, he will not be your shepherd after you pass from this life. So all these different things are listed. Wonderful, Consular, Prince of Peace, Lord of Lords, King of Everlasting Father. Do you find any negative name in there? Not one. To me, it brings encouragement of who Jesus actually is. He's your Savior. He's your Redeemer. He's your friend. He's the Son of God. He's the one that can help you as you're going through this dark time to your life. So what was the purpose of Jesus actually being born? You know, we know that Jesus, I hope you believe that Jesus was born, but why was Jesus born as a babe in a manger? Why did God allow Jesus to leave the glories of heaven and come down to the sin cursed earth, this sinful world, and allow his son to be go through such pain and agony? What was the purpose of it all? Show a servant heart. Show a servant heart? What else? I think it's so that he can identify with every aspect of us. If he came as a, as a man, he wouldn't have identified as a child or a teenager as well as he did this way. He experienced everything we do. Thank you. Yet without sin. So if you're going through a circumstance that you don't think is pleasant, think about it. Jesus experienced that too. He knows how to relate to that. It's hard to get in somebody's shoes if you have not walked through that situation yourself. But once you've done that, you at least know in part what they're going through. And not every situation is totally like, I understand that. But Jesus knows fully what you are going through, and yet without sin. And above, above that, amongst, amongst that whole situation, who was this message given to first? You know, when Jesus was born, okay, that's what I'm referring to. Who was it given to? It's not a trick question, okay. Shepherds, shepherds. If you look at the shepherd life, normally it was the children that had that responsibility to take care of the sheep. And if the adults, my understanding, if the adults, adults were the ones doing it, they were looked down upon. It was a very lower, meager task to be done, but the sheep had to be taken care of. Okay? God was willing to reach down to the lowest of men and lift them up. He reached down to an individual that would accept what he had to offer. There's people out there today that will say, they don't need God. They can get along without it. God responded to people that respected him and they said, you know, in essence, Jesus was be born to save them from their sins in short. I, there's probably different reasons why God revealed his message to the shepherds. They were willing to listen. How many times are you not able to listen to the message of God because you refuse? to take the time to listen to what God has to offer. You need to have listening ears and then take heed. I don't know what happened. Did they have, did they have other shepherds, you know, there when they went to go see their Jesus in the, in the manger? I don't know who took care of the sheep. But you know what was first in their lives? What took place? It was a message that was given them. Let us now go even to Bethlehem and see which thing would come to pass. And I didn't look in how many miles they traveled, whether it was even, even uh, a mile down the road or where, however far it was. They left what they had, had responded to take care of, to do something better. Do you have treasures in heaven that are more important? You put treasures in heaven that are more important than the things in this world are. What is controlling your life? Are you allowing God to give you peace and joy this morning? Or is it just for somebody else? I hope it's present within your own life. So in order to have the Prince of Peace controlling your life, you need to trust in God. And without that, you will not have peace in your heart. It's not going to take place. You think of this uh, virgin birth, I think it's a miracle of miracles. I think it tops them all off. It's 
something that man cannot come up with himself. And I ask the question, who is Jesus to you? I hope he's your friend and savior this morning. Tell people about this next week here, in this coming week, who Jesus is. He's not the babe, not no, no longer. He was, but he is your friend and your savior. He's the one that will redeem you. And you know what? He can redeem them too if they're not saved. Thank you to each of the teachers for taking your part. And we had a little bit of um, extra mail that wasn't enough to put in the mailboxes and a few left over from what we did have enough of. And we stuck it on the back there, so it's getting pretty full. If you have interest in it, take it. We might leave it there a Sunday or two, and then we will pitch it after that. And I believe Kelly finished her 50 verses, so you can come get your Bible. Good job. This time we'll have three songs, after which we'll turn the time here to the ministry. <clears throat> In the hymns of the church, turn to number 224. Two hundred twenty four.
216 <clears throat> Number 216 
Good morning. Greet each one in Jesus' name this morning. Sounded like Christmas this morning. Sounded like the week of Christmas. I wonder if it's been sounding like Christmas in your homes. And I also wonder what it would sound like if we didn't have Christmas songs. What would Christmas sound like without the familiar songs that are fairly seasonal here? Don't have to be. Christmas songs, they kind of lift your spirits or put you into thinking that Christmas time is coming, Christmas season, which is ultimately the birth of Jesus. So welcome, welcome visitors. Feel free to participate in getting worshiping together here this morning. Have a few announcements. Begin with a heartfelt thank you from myself and the ministry to each and every one who participated this week in the funeral and the arrangements and calling hours, preparing food, sharing food, and your prayers, and your prayers. They've been keenly felt. And may you continue to pray for Bryce and Lene and their grieving. Times like this, the brotherhood is invaluable, as was, as was experienced. Also, change in program, the service this evening has been canceled, um, so use that profitably in visitation with all that has been going on. The program that was is canceled. Um, this pertains to the congregation here. There's an observation that, that we've made with so many um, vehicles in the parking lot, just put it plainly. The elderly should have a place to park that is convenient to come into the church. So if we could respectfully allow them a portion of the parking out here in front of the doors, even if it's empty when you come, leave it empty for them. If it's empty when you leave, it's still okay. It's so they have a place to park. Um, they might not get here before Sunday school and then not have a place to park. Um, we could put handicap signs up, but then it would be required that you're tagged to park there. So if we just leave them open, anybody that is elderly or wanting or needing to park close can park closer. So just we'll try that allow a portion of the parking lot there in, the, in front of these doors for all those who need to park closer. We would appreciate that. Now maybe a, a rather lengthy one. Um, many of you have heard that all of the hostages have been freed. And we praise the Lord for that. And I wondered what it would look like if we would praise the Lord for as many days as we prayed for their release. I think that would be worthy. Christian Aid Ministries is concerned that everybody hears a fairly accurate account, and I'm going to read some, a statement from them. It is so that all these congregations can kind of hear from them what took place and what transpired. And at the end of this statement, you are still going to have questions. But this is to bring clarity, and you can feel pretty good about the information coming from Christian Aid Ministries. I read, the question has come up about whether or not the final group of hostages was freed or whether it was an escape. We praise God for his mighty work in arranging a, deliver a deliverance and guiding them to safety. The following account is what we understand at this point about what took place. Over time of the, their, act, their captivity, God gave various hostages a desire to attempt an escape, but it took them a while to all agree on when or how this should take place. They sought God in prayer over and over again, seeking direction from him. 
It took time and God's work, but after much discussion and prayer, they became solidly united and decided God was leading them this way. The hostages shared that this eventually, eventual sense of unity was in itself a great miracle. On several occasions, they planned to escape, but they had decided if specific things didn't happen, they would accept that as God's direction to wait. This happened once or twice, assuring them it was not God's timing. They continued earnestly to seek God in prayer after discussing their plans the group felt united that they should escape on the night of Wednesday, December 15. They placed this, their situation in God's hands, depending on him for protection and for guidance. During the night, as God directed, they sensed the time was right. They prepared, they put on their shoes, packed water in their clothes for the journey. They found a way to open the door that was closed and blocked filed silently to the path they had chosen to follow and quickly left the place they were held despite the fact that numerous guards were close by. In the distance, they could see a mountain. They could see a mountain feature that they recognized they knew this was the direction to go. They also followed the sure guidance of the stars as they journeyed through the night. This group included a married couple, a 10-month-old baby, a 3-year-old child, a 14-year-old girl, a 15-year-old boy, four single men, two single women. With God's help and protection and leading, they quickly made their way through the night they walked for possibly as much as 10 miles, traveling through woods and thickets, working through thorns and briars. The moon provided light for their path. During the times they weren't sure which way to go, they stopped and prayed, asking God to show them. After a number of hours of walking, they and the day began to dawn, and they eventually found someone who help them call for help. They finally were free. Thanks be to God. Pray. Prior to this final deliverance, we praise God for how he made a way for the other hostages to be released. All these steps were obviously leading up to the end of this two-month journey of difficulty. No doubt your prayers to the Almighty God played a part in all the hostages now being reunited with their loved ones. The hostages desired that God be glorified for the way he cared for them during their captivity and arranged for their deliverance. End of reading that. So we just praise God for bringing deliverance in his own time and way and the whole world was the spectators. So continue to pray for the hostages as they come home. Is there any announcements is, that come from the, any of you? We have the birthdays yet. Oh, we got Brother Bert. Thank you again for your support throughout the year. Thank you for the gift box. On Wednesday evening, the card, the money, we appreciate your support and your love in that way. Any other announcements? We have the birthdays. We have uh, birthdays on Tuesday. First one is Gail on Hirschberger, so happy birthday, Dad. And one that missed the calendar last year and was not in the bulletin is Briley Noenswander. So she'll be having a birthday on Tuesday, her first birthday. We have Doris Schrock having a birthday on Friday. So happy birthday, Doris. And we'd like to just notice that Linda Wenger would have had a birthday on Friday, right? I think Friday. 
All right, the offering this morning is for the home mission so the ushers can come forward. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time we can gather freely to worship you in this place. Thank you for each one here. May our hearts be opened and worshiping you, ready to receive a word from the Lord. We thank you for your mighty power and your mighty acts that you've shown to the world, to your people, that you love, and bringing home the hostages in such a mighty way. We praise you. We want to continue to praise you for that. Thank you for delivering us from sin, giving us freedom, giving us hope. Pray for Brother Maynard as he preaches this morning. Give him a message to preach. May you meet the needs of the hour and inspire our hearts and encourage us, strengthening our faith. Pray for Bryce and Lene that you would lift them up and comfort them at this time of grieving. The Schrock family as they are also grieving. We pray for the offering. May it be used for your honor and your glory in this mission and it would be distributed according to your will. And we thank you for the way you give to us that we can, in return, give to others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I greet you this morning in the precious name of Jesus, the highest name that human tongue can utter, the one that the angel came and brought the news that thou shalt call his name Jesus, because he shall deliver the people from their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. We sang together, O come, let us adore him, and I believe that that was obvious this morning in our singing. The singing sounded real good. If you didn't think it did from where you sat, we'll trade places and maybe next Sunday you can come sit up here, but it's, it sounded like you were worshiping. The question was asked in our Sunday school class this morning, are you tired of the Christmas story? And I know it provides a challenge for Sunday school teachers. It provides a challenge for us as preachers to a certain point. But when the teacher asked that question, are you tired of the Christmas story, my head went this way. And you can't hear it rattle, I understand that, but I was, I was saying no. Because I was reminded, as I thought of the season again, as I was thinking of preparing a message, how important this is to us every day. It's not a story that gets old. Yeah, we accept the challenge of, we want to share something new, something in a different way from time to time. To be honest, I don't remember who preached last year's Christmas message. Did you, Keith? I don't know. And I don't know if any of you remember. If you do, bless your heart. But I was reminded again of the freshness of what this story means and what it holds for each one of us this morning as children of God. I don't know about you, but I needed God's forgiveness last week. I needed it yesterday. I needed it this morning. And it's all because of Jesus that we can come to God and we can maintain that relationship with him because of the gift. So as I said, I guess sometimes, especially as Sunday school teachers, and you know, we have a bit of a challenge because we 
don't know exactly what to say that you don't remember that we said last year, and that's okay. Let's turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth his son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Let's turn to Luke chapter 2. Verses 8 through 11. It says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the flock, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David his Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This was the gift that God sent upon this earth. And we studied in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. And we could go on in Isaiah chapter 9, the verses that we had in Sunday school. Then we come back to Matthew chapter 2, here in verses 10 through 12. says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. The part of this story that really stood out to me this last week was the people that found Jesus. Here it says in Matthew chapter 2, here are the last verses that we read. When the wise men saw the star, it says they rejoiced with exceeding great joy and they followed the star and they found Jesus. The shepherds found Jesus. We could go down through the Gospels. You remember the lad that had his lunch with him for the day? I forget, was it two loaves, two fishes, and whatever the amount of loaves and fishes was, that lad found Jesus. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus found Jesus. And I believe it's in Luke chapter 19, I'm not quite sure, I think it is, that Zacchaeus found Jesus. I believe the centurion that helped to nail Jesus to the cross. I'm not sure what the depth or exactly in what way to say this morning, but he found Jesus. He said, surely this was the Son of God. He found Jesus. And more importantly, the thief on the cross found Jesus. And you know, as you reflect on those people that found Jesus... You know, it's mentioned here this morning that, you know, there's times that we go through dark days. We go through low spots. But there's people that in their darkness found Jesus. Nicodemus went to Jesus by night, and he found Jesus. If you need to go looking for Jesus at night, go, but you'll find him. You can find Jesus. And I think the thing that probably would touch the heart of God this morning as much as it did back then is the people today that find Jesus. It stood out to me, I guess, as Keith was reading that account, 
how those people, as they were escaping, saw a light. They followed the stars. They saw a light, and they found their way home. You know, we could ask the question this morning, you know, what does Christmas mean to you? Just, I don't know, 10 days ago, I was at a place of business, and the day or the date was mentioned, and this person that I was working with said, you know what, tomorrow in two weeks is Christmas, and she was excited. And so I asked some questions, I asked her, you know, you know, what they're going to be doing around Christmas, or what was the reason for her excitement, and it centered around her children and the joy that she would see in them opening their gifts. And she brought in this whole thing of Santa. And so I asked her some more questions. I asked her, you know, so what does Santa do for them? Well, she goes and she starts naming the gifts that some of her children were going to be getting. So I asked her, so in other words, you're going to be Santa? Well, she said, yeah. Well, it opened the opportunity for some more interaction, and I'd have to say I probably didn't do as much as what I should, but I'm also trying to be careful not to cause an offense. We all try to do that. But I believe there's right ways of sharing what Christmas actually is, what it means to us. Because it's imperative. There's, we all know the story, <laughs> there's children that love to play with the, wrapper, with the wrapping of their gifts. And I believe that's what so much of our society is doing. They're only playing with the wrapper, with the wrapping. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no vari variableness, neither shadow of turning. If I'd ask you this morning how many of you have ever received a gift, probably every hand would go up, I'm not sure. But how many of you have never received a gift? I thought if you haven't, maybe at least we as a church could help you out. But I think all of you have received a gift. How many of us know what it is to give a gift, whether it's somebody in your family, somebody that you loved, you gave them a gift, and they left it set? They didn't care about the gift. Maybe you gave a really expensive gift to your child. And they didn't want it. They said, I have enough. They didn't want the gift that you gave them. Brother Bert mentioned the gift that we as a ministry got, and I thank you for that. But I thought there was also a, an example there. There was a box with groceries and numerous things in there, but there was an envelope on top of the box I opened that envelope and there was a check inside. Now I can tell you that if I don't deposit that check, it will do me no good. The gift that you thought that you gave me, if I burn that check or if I lose that check, it does me no good. It's only if I accept that check and I deposit that check that it will do me any good. God gave us all a gift. And the question that I ask myself and you this morning, what are you doing with that gift? Have you received that gift? You know, without opening the gift, without taking off the wrapping, how do we know what that gift contains and what it can do for you? You know, God gave mankind a gift hundreds of years ago, and it's very unique because it's just right. It was just right for the shepherds. It was just right for the wise men. It was for the Jews. It was for the Gentiles. It was for the Samaritans, the Romans, and everyone else in their day. And not only for those that existed back then, it was a gift for you and I this morning. It was given for all mankind, and that includes you and I this morning. And the question I wanted, wanted us to consider this morning, have you opened your gift? Because if you don't open your gift, it's not going to do you any good. And so what are you celebrating this morning? You know, there's people that love to travel through big towns, see all the lights, see all the festivities and all the fun. But I believe it's like the spirit of Christmas, perhaps, 
In other words, we enjoy the spirit of Christmas, but it's only the wrapping paper. We haven't really opened the gift and allowed it to do its work in our heart and our life. For those of you that have opened that gift, what does that gift contain? What is the first thing that stands out to you as you look at the gift that God gave? What does that gift contain? It's pretty simple. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Have you ever tried to put a wrapping paper on love? We were trying to, I guess, find definition, definitions for some words in our Sunday school class this morning. But if you try to put a wrapping paper on love or give, it, or give a definition for love, it's almost difficult. I don't know for you as husbands this morning, if you tried to convey to your wife in a gift, maybe you don't give gifts at Christmas and that's okay, but if you bought a Christmas gift for your wife, are you sure that what you bought is adequate to convey your love for your wife? Is it adequate or vice versa? The gift that you bought for your husband, is it adequate to convey your love to them? How can you put a wrapping paper on love? Can you feel love when it's given as a gift? You know, even, you know, we feel helpless in conveying our love to our companions, to our families, to the people that we love. We associate value with the amount of sacrifice that it costs. You know, and friends, this morning, I hope we don't jeopardize our checking accounts in order to try to somehow convey through money or the amount of money that we spend in gifts for our loved ones because you can't do it justly. But many times we associate value with the amount of sacrifice that it costs to give a gift. Well, Romans 5, verse 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's one thing to make a contribution, but it's totally different to make a complete sacrifice. And the thing that we find so limiting, I guess, is we only have one life to give. You could give your life for your companion or for your family, and you're, you only have one life to give. But Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 13, he said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I said it's in the sacrifice that we are willing to make. And we look at the gift that God gave us and the love that he displayed in the, in the gift that he gave that of his son. It says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 15, it says, Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket. And are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh, taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And we as men this morning, we try to make business sense out of the investments that we make. And God looked us, at us as mankind as a speck of dust. And we wonder, why didn't he just pull the curtain and just cover us all up? He could easily have done that. Probably many of us, from a human perspective, would have probably have done that. But because of God's love, he didn't do that. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 through 19 says, That we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Can we somehow try to absorb the love of God? It says the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height so that we can experience that more fully in our hearts. Then we, are obligated, we feel obligated to return that. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. And I found that to be, I believe, something that's very important in us returning that love. It says here in verse... Chapter, Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. It says, And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother. They fell down and they worshipped him. 
And then it says they opened their treasures. Probably find myself referring back too often to our Sunday school class, and if you get tired of that, you can tell me. But last Sunday, we were asked what worship means. My response was that it's a pouring out of adoration. Here it says that when the wise men saw the gift, it says they fell down and they worshiped. There's a lot in those words. It says they fell down and they worshiped. And I could imagine this morning, when you truly get a grip of what this gift is, you're going to fall down and worship. It affects our posture. And I can tell you this, it affects your eyes because your eyes are going to be moist. It should bring tears to our eyes as we try to analyze what this gift actually, what it costs, and what it does for you and me this morning. It says they fell down, they fell down prostrate. And to me, that's an act of true humility. It's an act of brokenness. They fell down and they worshiped. As I said in verse, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. And I trust this morning that we never lose sight of that. We don't get tired of, again, going through this account. We call it the Christmas season, the Christmas story, and we have to identify it somehow and understand. As you open up this gift, this wrapper, first of all, you find love. I believe that the second thing that we find is forgiveness. We read in verse 21 of chapter 1 of Matthew, it says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. You open that gift, you fall down and you worship. You receive, this is part of the package. It's the love of God and his forgiveness. Is there anyone here this morning that doesn't need forgiveness? I said in my experience, I needed it last week. I needed it yesterday. I needed it this morning. The psalmist in Psalms 51, verses 1 through 3 says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, bought out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Because of this gift this morning, we can experience release from the burden of sin, the guilt of sin, and that's what David was talking about here. He experienced release from the burden of sin. Because of this gift, we can experience release from the power of sin. You know, some of us, we're not that perfect. We stumble again and again. But we don't have to be stumbling all the time, over and over and over again. But if we do, we can come back and again experience that forgiveness of sin if we acknowledge our transgressions. But we don't have to live there. We can experience victory over sin. He gives us that power. And then we can experience release from the eternal consequences of sin. I said eternal consequences of sin. There are consequences that are not that we're not released from. There is reaping. There is consequences for some of the choices that we make. But we, we experience release from the eternal consequences of sin, and that is that of eternal death. I believe the third, as we go a little deeper into the wrapper, because of his love and because of forgiveness, we can experience peace. In Luke chapter 2, verse 14, the angel's message to mankind was glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And you know, this morning, I'm sure some of us struggle with that. There is so much turmoil, there's so much chaos, there's so many things happening in society around us. We wonder where is that peace on earth? But you know, I think for each one of us this morning, we can peel off those layers of turmoil, all those things that trouble us, and we get down underneath, 
and in our relationship with God, we experience peace. God has made that possible, and really with that peace is underneath there, I believe that peace can keep coming up through all those struggles and all that turmoil that we face, and we can experience peace in our hearts and in our life. Peace within the heart can be experienced in the midst of the storm because God doesn't send his children through circumstances. He goes with them. He takes them through. The fourth one that I have as we go down through the gift of this wrapping is that of joy. If we're experiencing that love, the forgiveness, the peace, I believe there's a joy that in spite of the turmoil and all the things that we experience in life, that was the message of the angels. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Tidings of great joy shall bring great joy to our hearts this morning. That the Redeemer that was promised thousands of years ago has arrived. You know, God was true to his word. He hasn't forgotten us. It says in Matthew 2, verse 10, it says, When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. I said, we can find Jesus in spite of the darkness that surrounds us. I can only imagine the wise men. To us, it would have looked like a dark, a dark darkness enveloped them, but they saw a light. And they followed that light and it says they rejoiced with exceeding great joy because of what that light revealed to them. Our being led to Christ should fill us with joy. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He's our Savior, our friend, our all in all. There is no other way of life, and there is no peace to the soul until that is found. Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while we have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he, walketh, he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. It says, While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. You know, if the shepherds, if the wise men would not have followed the light when they saw the light, they would have lost opportunity. And I believe that's true for each one of us. We need to grasp the opportunity that we have to follow the light when we see the light. Then we can find that experience as well. And this morning, I trust that our hearts are filled with joy because of the fulfillment of God's promise. The Redeemer has come. And last but not least, but I believe that these all need to come in proper order. But after we've experienced that love and that forgiveness and that peace and that joy, you open that envelope, and inside that envelope, there's a ticket. In Romans 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. It says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Can you imagine with me this morning, I believe we can only imagine in part what the hostages experienced when they were released, when they saw their loved ones. It says the wages of sin is death, but we open that envelope, that last envelope, and there's a ticket inside that envelope, and it has on eternal life. You carry that ticket with you. You can experience it. It begins here and now. This gift is priceless when we consider the options because there are only two options. It's life or death. All of us have earned the wages of sin. We were headed for death. But inside this gift, there is a ticket for glory. Luke chapter 16, verse 22. We have the account there of Abraham and Lazarus. And also it includes the rich man. It says in verse 22 of Luke chapter 16, It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Friends, this morning, in that same verse, it says that both of them died. And unless Jesus returned, there will also be a paragraph in the paper someday with your name that you died. It says the wages of sin is death, and physical death is part of that. In Luke chapter 16, verse 23 and 24, it says, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, 
and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. At the end of life comes death, the time when the soul leaves the body and returns to its maker. For both of those, life's story was written. Both of them were experiencing the rewards or the consequences of the choices that they had made. Hebrews 9.27 says, and as, it, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. You know, this morning, it doesn't matter whether we're rich or whether we're poor. It doesn't matter whether we're old or whether we're young. Regardless whether I used my time wisely or whether I didn't, regardless whether I completed what I thought was my life's agenda, we're going to face death. And God will determine what that will be, whether, what time or when that experience will be. But as I see it this morning, it comes back to one important question. Have I opened my gift? Have you opened your gift? Unless you receive and open this gift and you apply it to your, to your life, it'll benefit you nothing. You can't go to any supermarket and buy this gift. You can't purchase this gift at all, and you won't find it in Bethlehem this morning. You won't find it in Nazareth. You won't find it in a, in a manger bed. This morning, you can still find that gift at Calvary. And it's not because Jesus is still on the cross, but his work on the cross still stands. And that's where we go to have our sins forgiven. That's where he paid the price of our redemption. That's where his body was nailed to the cross. That's where the blood gushed out of his side. It was his blood when it should have been mine. I believe Jesus is looking down from heaven this morning, and he's asking the question, will you receive my gift? Have you received my gift? You know, my mind went to two individuals that had the same opportunity They lived in the same time frame as Jesus did, and they died the same day Jesus did. Both of them lived during Jesus' physical life. And in fact, both of them died on the same hill that Jesus did. They died because of a series of wrong choices. They were both under the condemnation of sin. They were both within reach of their Savior. The one reached out and he accepted the gift. The other one rejected it. The one experienced love. He experienced forgiveness, peace, joy, eternal life. And the other one experienced damnation. And I thought it was so wonderful how that already immediately, the day that Jesus died, his death was redemptive in the life of a sinner. And Jesus said, that's why I came. And I'm sure there was great rejoicing in heaven because, again, that's why I came. That's what Jesus is saying to us this morning. That's why I came. To bring, to bring love, forgiveness, peace, joy, eternal life. Have you opened your gift this morning? Shall we have a song?
You know, we were reminded this morning, I believe there's somebody here that's celebrating Christmas for the first time. Some of you here this morning have went through this season however many times. I'm looking at someone that's going through it for the 91st time. And I'm trusting it becomes more special each time. It doesn't have to grow old. And I trust it's our experience again as we go through this season. Shall we stand for prayer? Our Father in heaven, we come to you again this morning with grateful hearts for your love, your mercy, the forgiveness that we can experience because of your love, and the peace and the joy, and also our expectation and our hope of eternal life. Lord, we thank you that you have made that possible for each one that has been created, and Lord, we know that there are those that have chosen to reject. Lord, may, not, may there not be any under the sound of my voice this morning that has made that choice to reject your love. Lord, this morning we again reach out in humility for we know it because we understand that we are unworthy of your love, but Lord, we thank you that you have made that possible this morning. Bless each one for being here, and as we again are reminded anew of your love and your gift to us, may we share that love to those that we come in contact with. Bless us as we part, we just pray that our lives would every day honor you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.